One of my greatest fears personally is the idea of going missing without anyone knowing where I am or what became of me. This is typically why if I go somewhere like alone, I'll drop some information on it. But you know, an easier way even past that is to just kind of go with a group. There's a Kenyan proverb, if I remember correctly, that those who want to go fast go alone, and those that want to go far go together. The idea of being in a group in an unfamiliar environment to face off against the elements effectively and potentially any, you know, animals or humans that might show up is greatly increased by the actual presence of other people. However, just because your chances are better doesn't mean that you're good to go and nothing will happen. Arguably what's even worse than the idea of being alone and something happening is the idea of being in a large group together and something still going wrong and nobody to this day is able to figure out what exactly happened to you and your companions. One such event resulted in the end of over nine people through absolutely bizarre means ranging from hypothermia to full-on blunt force trauma that is still yet to be discerned as to what exactly happened, although there's always plenty of theories surrounding the mysterious hiking and camping event. So today let's discuss the Dyatlov Pass incident. It was a bright, crisp Soviet day in 1959 when a sports club would convene and begin discussing the idea of forming a type of skiing expedition across the northern Urals in Sverdlovsk Oblast, which Okay, I'm American, like that's really hard to pronounce. Like, go look that up, the actual pronunciation. You won't be able to pronounce it. So this is in the Soviet Union, and uh, again, this is going to be a pronunciation episode because I'm from the southeast of the United States, and let's just say my Russian is a little rusty. Anyhow, they would go on to name this expedition across this terrain, and it was actually named after the 21st Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Essentially, these were young Leninists who were kind of together and discussing their politics, and that's what they would do. And from here, it appears that they were, you know, considering they were younger, naturally other ventures besides just politics would show up, which is likely where the idea even came from in the first place. An engineering student around this time at the Ural Polytechnical Institute named Igor Dytlov would put together this fateful trip that only one would return from as a stroke of luck while the other nine would go, Igor included, on to meet their end in some pretty difficult to explain ways. Sending out a call to his fellow students of the university, as mentioned, Nine would answer the call. This group originally consisted of eight men and two women. The one who would return back, which ultimately saved his life, had to do so because of health issues, which he lived to be 75 before finally meeting his end in 2013. The experience of the other hikers had is what makes this situation even more bizarre. Typically when people go missing, you tend to think, ah, oh, well, they were total newbies who had no clue what they were doing, so of course this would happen. Except, you would be wrong in this case. Each member had a minimum grade 2 hiker experience with ski tour experience, and this was like a run for them to get their grade 3, which they didn't just get grade 2, like they were already experienced. So grade 3 at this time is the highest experience achievable, but this may have actually hindered them in some aspects rather than helped. Now this is purely speculation on my part, but when you get a bunch of young men together with experience, and then throw some women into the mix, well, our brains kind of tend to go a little ape mode unfortunately. This can lead to things like bravado taking over experience and even in a knowledgeable individual, they will assume their own ideas to be the most relevant which can lead to infighting as well as dangerous placement of encampments as someone assumes himself to be the correct one. We will discuss later how this may have actually caused this issue, but again, this is just speculation for what I could see on my part. Mainly because I used to be a younger man at one point, so I remember the unga brain that I would have and just be stricken with in my early 20s. But moving on! This group upon their successful hike across the area would return home to receive their grade 3, which would imply that they again were highly knowledgeable about wilderness in general as well as survival techniques required to exist in a Siberian winter. Because if you didn't know, like 30 minutes into like being cold, you drop. So to receive this actual designation, they would be required to hike over 190 miles, which comes out to 300 kilometers in heathen language. With this information in mind, their hike planned to go to the far northern regions of Sverdlovsk Oblast and the upper streams of the Lazva River. This was certified and approved by the Sverdlovsk City Route Commission, which was a division of the Sverdlovsk Committee of Physical Culture and Sport. It's all sounding very Soviet Union-y in here, isn't it? The group of 10 at the time was approved on January 8, 1959. On January 23rd, they were given a route book so that they would know where they were headed, where the expedition's actual goal was to reach the Otorten Mountain, which was 6.2 miles or 10 kilometers north of the site where the group would horrifically meet their end. The route was considered to be rather difficult with some treacherous terrain and was estimated to have been a Category 3, which, surprise, surprise, luckily for them, the most difficult time to traverse this terrain was actually considered to be in February, squarely where they would be time-wise. Joy abound. 
The group then set off at this point and board a train heading to Ivedel, which was a town at the center of the northern province of Sverdlovsk Oblast, early that morning on January 25th, 1959. Because it was Soviet Russia, well, that sounded like way more Canadian listening back to that than Russian. Anyways, I don't really think the Russians care anymore, probably. They would then board a truck and take it to the last inhabited town known as Vizhai, which was a lorry village far to the north, where they would then spend the night. At this point, they would begin to carbo-load, which involves eating a bunch of carbs to increase your energy levels and give your body an adequate supply of glucose to burn. Although fat burning provides a much more consistent and steady burn, if you didn't know. Being fat adapted might not give you, like, crackhead energy, but you can go for days and not even be hungry. Prior to heading out at this time, Daitalov also agreed that he would send a telegram back to the sports club to maintain that contact. He would get in touch with them as soon as they returned back to Vizhai, and they should probably expect it around February 12th at the latest. However, before Yudin, the hiker who would turn back, which we'll discuss here in a moment, went back to town, Daitalov told him it would likely be longer than February 12th, so don't sweat it if they didn't get a message back before then. On January 27th, they would set out towards Gora or Torten, the mountain mentioned earlier, but only one day into the hike, one member was already struggling, which ironically, despite probably feeling like weak at the time because of him, you know, having to turn back due to disorders such as rheumatism and congenital heart defects, which also, fun fact, I was born with a hole in between my ventricles and my heart. Hopefully that won't come back to haunt me later in life. Anyways, he decided to turn back to the village as his knee and joint pain rendered him unable to continue the trek. Leaving the other nine, that would be the last time he would see them alive. Time passes as time tends to do, and then when enough time had passed, the group would then start getting tracked as they had been gone for way too long to be considered normal. Because of this, teams would be sent out in order to track them down as, like, the group just completely vanished. And then they would begin to find their diaries and cameras left behind at their last campsite, which made the task of tracking them and finding them a little bit easier. Although, as we know, it would be too late. On January 31st, the group would arrive at the edge of the highland area, begin to prepare for the arduous task of climbing. Again, Category 3 terrain with like mountains in February in northern Russia. No thanks. Prior to this task, however, they would actually cache a surplus of food and equipment in the Woodland Valley in case they needed to come back, and this is kind of a common thing to do. You put food out of reach of animals along your hike so that you don't have to expend the energy carrying it the whole way. And if you space it correctly, at most you'd go like a day without food, which is totally survivable. Water, on the other hand, not so much. Everyone says that you survive three days without water, which, eh, yes, you survive for three days without water. Time-wise, though, after about one day without water and vigorous activity, you were basically sedentary and delusional by the second day, and then the third day you drop. So you basically have to have people find you by the second day for you to really be revived. So it's not like you're doing fine right up until hour 72. Remember that when you're in the wilderness. Anyhow, the following day, the hikers would start to make money moves on getting through the pass, and it seems their original idea was to get over the pass and make camp for the next night on the back hill side. However, it's February in the far north. Weather conditions never seem to cooperate, and they sure didn't start in 1959. The weather would take a turn for the worse, which whipped up snowstorms that severely decreased visibility. See, down in Georgia, we don't get snowstorms, so visibility to me has never really been that altered here, except in like severe thunderstorms and maybe hurricanes. However, I've seen videos. It looks horrifying. Like 10 feet out, you can't see in front of you. You can't see anything. I just expect like a giant animal to come out and eat you. This is what may have actually spelled the downfall for the group in all honesty. They would lose their sense of direction and they were not able to locate landmarks with such heavy snow and poor visibility. They would then begin listing westwards towards Coilet Seattle, which... Oh my God. At this point, however, they would realize something was amiss, and they weren't where they should have been, and rather than just keep on trekking, they would kind of set up camp on the slope of a mountain as opposed to walking another 1.5 kilometers and or 1 mile into the forest area that would have actually sheltered them. It is very likely because of the snowstorm that they didn't even see a forest down there, and after hiking all day, the short jaunt may have seemed insurmountable. It's also hypothesized that possibly Igor did not want to walk down the mountain just to walk back up the next day when the storm possibly passed, and this was a good chance also how to learn to camp on the sides of mountains anyways. See, this is why I think unfortunately some bravado may have come into play and like mix with everything based on the decisions that were being made. I would have definitely preferred a forest to sleep in when it was snowing, but you also have to take into consideration that snow does knock down trees, and if it knocks down a tree onto your campsite, uh, you're definitely going to bite the dust on that one. So, because of the previously mentioned conversation concerning some discrepancy about their return date, 
The 12th of February would come and go and no messages would be received. Because of what Daitilov said, action would not be taken to look for the missing hikers because it was deemed unnecessary as they were still in the allotted time pocket and this was actually a fairly common thing to take place. I mean, tech back then wasn't amazing, so it's not like you could just fire up a GPS for your location. So not hearing from someone, it was just sort of like one of those deals where you had to assume they were all right. However, around the 20th of February, the families of the hikers had had enough. They demanded action and a rescue operation would be conducted. The head of the institute would launch the first rescue groups, which consisted of volunteer students and teachers. Arguably, not the best group to send out into the area where experienced hikers had gone missing in a large group, but hey, any port in a storm, I suppose. As the search dragged on for the missing hikers, the army and police would finally get involved as planes and helicopters would join in on the search for the hikers. On February 26, an absolutely bizarre sight would be found. The rescue teams would end up finding the group's abandoned and badly damaged tent in Koyat Sakal. What they would see is also a series of clues that would go on to completely baffle everyone there, and still to this day, it's not fully explained. Here you have a group of experienced hikers, used to being outdoors, knew how to camp, had supplies and the ability to survive, and yet everything seemed to point to them completely losing their minds out on this mountain. One of the students, Mikhail, found a tent and stated the tent was torn down and covered with snow. It was empty and all the group's belongings and shoes had been left behind. Now, there were quite a few hypotheses as to what actually went down and how these people ended up like they were, but prior to getting into that, let's wrap up the list of things they found because every hypothesis seems to have like a shred of truth and deductive reasoning to it, but then it falls short of explaining the entire scenario, which makes it even more strange, honestly. Like, this whole thing is bizarre. So investigators would be brought in after the campsite was discovered to try and ascertain as to what exactly transpired. And spoiler alert, they didn't know and likely went to their graves just as confused as we are today. Investigating the tent, they would find it had been cut open from the inside, which, I mean, yeah, it's a little odd, as you can might imagine. Further scouting the area revealed that there were nine sets of footprints that were left by people who only had socks or maybe like a single shoe on. Some would even run out barefooted entirely, which people running with anything that they had at that time seems to suggest like an event had been taken place that was big enough of a threat to make immediate moves out of the area necessary. They would then follow this to the edge of the nearby woods. Possibly they ran there to seek shelter from something or from some storm in general when they realized they were freezing. But if they were running from something in such little clothing, around 1600 feet or 500 meters down, these tracks would be covered with snow, but they would find the remains of a small fire that was lit, which was under a large Serbian pine. This would have also provided shelter from the wind and snow to a degree that would allow for the fire to actually have been built. But again, why did they come down here in the first place? To build a fire, it may have been easier because, you know, you're not on the side of a mountain in a snowstorm where snow is just going to be destroying the fire and wind's going to be whipping it up and not allowing you to actually burn anything. But why take such little clothing with you? The first two bodies that would be discovered were of Krivonashenko and Doroshenko. Both were shoeless and, like many of the others, appeared to have paradoxically undressed and were down to their underwear. There was a tree in the area that had its branches broken about 15 feet high or 5 meters, which seems to imply at least one of the skiers had tried to climb up the tree to look for something, possibly a nearby village or a town or even a cabin, or maybe they were even looking for where their original camp was. Seeing as they would have lit a fire, if something was going after them or was close to them, I mean, like, let's say it was a bear or a person, right? I mean... They could have climbed up after the skier and the bodies in the area would have been like either destroyed or mauled or half eaten, which is not the case. So the idea that they were actually running from something doesn't seem to hold up. Of course, these two could have survived the initial encounter and rightfully so decided they needed to return to camp for clothing, but were exposed for too long. Between the pine and the camp, the searchers would go on to find three more bodies. Daitlov, Polomagorva, and Slobodin. These three had succumbed in specific poses which suggest that they were attempting to return to the camp to likely get warm. They did not make it very far, only being about 300, 480, and 630 meters respectively from the tree, meaning the cold came in and got them quickly. So what we have so far is a group that appears to have abandoned their camp extremely quickly and without the forethought to grab any extra provisions. Because of most of them that were just wearing their underwear or having just a sock or single shoe on, it may have been like grab what you can and run, which left them very little. At that point, whatever attacked the camp supposedly had left the area, at least this is you know possibly one of the hypotheses that exists, 
But the skiers then ran into the forest, and they kind of already had enough exposure at this point to begin altering how they could move, think, and plan. Then returning back to the camp, they would succumb to their exposure. But I'm just going to go ahead and spoiler alert this. One of the things that they suggest is like how an avalanche caused this. But then if an avalanche caused that and then pushed the bodies down there, why were their footprints coming from their camp? This has always been the biggest issue I've seen. But anyways, at this point, the other four skiers would not be found for another two months. Then around May of that year, under 13 feet of snow or 4 meters in a ravine, 250 feet away or 75 meters away, into the woods from the pine tree, they had been found. Three of them were found to have shown basically they had taken the clothing from those that had already fell, which may explain why some of them were down to their underwear, but it still does not explain why most of them were running out of the campsite with only socks or like a single shoe on. Dubino was wearing Kronoshenko's burned and torn trousers, and her left foot and shin were wrapped in a torn jacket. A legal inquest started immediately after the first five bodies were found. A medical examination found no injuries that might have led to their actual ends, and it was concluded that they had all succumbed to hypothermia. Lobodin had a small crack in his skull, but it was not enough to be a fatal wound. An examination of the other four bodies found in May shifted that narrative of the incident. Three of the hikers had actual fatal injuries. Brignolis had major skull damage, and Dubina and Zolo Tayov had major chest fractures. According to Boris Vizrosini, the force required to cause such damage would have been extremely high, comparable to that of a car crash. Notably, the bodies had no external wounds associated with bone fractures, as if they had been subjected to a high level of pressure. All four bodies found at the bottom of the creek in a running stream of water had soft tissue damage to their head and face. For example, Yumina was missing her tongue, eyes, and part of her lips, as well as facial tissue and a fragment of skull bone, while Zoltoyov had his eyeballs missing and Kovatov his eyebrows. The forensic expert performing the post-mortem examination judged that these injuries happened post-mortem due to the location of the bodies in the stream. There was initial speculation that the indigenous Mansi people, reindeer herders in the local area, had attacked and murdered the group for encroaching upon their lands. Several Mansi were interrogated, but the investigation indicated that the nature of the deaths did not support this hypothesis. Only the hikers' footprints were visible, and they showed no sign of hand-to-hand -hand struggle. Although the temperature was very low, around negative 25 to negative 30 degrees Celsius, which is negative 13 to negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit, with a snowstorm blowing, the dead were only partially dressed. Some had only one shoe, while others only wore socks. Some were found wrapped in snips of ripped clothes that seemed to have been cut from those who were already dead. Journalists reporting on the available parts of the inquest files claim that it states six of the group members died of hypothermia and three of fatal injuries. There were no indications that other people nearby of Kolatsakal apart from like the nine travelers, the tent had been ripped open from within. The victims had died six to eight hours after their last meal. Traces from the camp showed that all group members left the campsite of their own accord and on foot. Some levels of radiation were found in one of the victims' clothings, bizarrely enough. To spell the theory of like an attack by indigenous Mansi people, Basradini stated that the fatal injuries of the three bodies could not have been caused by human beings because the force of the blows had been too strong and no soft tissue damage had occurred. They then released documents containing no information about the condition of the skier's internal organs, and there were also no survivors. At the time, the official conclusion was that the group members had died because of the compelling natural force. The inquest officially ceased in May of 1959 as a result of the absence of a guilty party. The files were then sent to a secret archive. On the 12th of April, 2018, Zoltarev's remains were exhumed in the initiative of journalists of the Russian tabloid newspaper. Contradictory results were then obtained. One of the experts said that the character of the injuries resembled a person knocked down by a car, and the DNA analysis did not reveal any similarity to the DNA of living relatives. In addition, it turned out that Zoltarev's name was like not on a list of those buried in the cemetery. Nevertheless, the reconstruction of the face from the exhumed skull matched post-war photographs of Zoltarov, although journalists expressed suspicions that another person was hiding under Zoltarov's name after World War II. In February 2019, Russian authorities reopened the investigation into the incident, although only three possible explanations were being considered. An avalanche, a slab avalanche, or a hurricane. The possibility of a crime had been discounted. Natural causes seem to be more in line with what may have actually happened, apart from, you know, the blunt force tr like pressure. Maybe a tree fell on somebody? I, that's the biggest issue. I suppose if you fall from high enough and land on a rock, maybe that might happen? But, uh, I don't know, it's a little odd. But anyways, it does not fully explain the ways in which they seem to just panic and run. 
Now, obviously, in a snowstorm in February at that latitude, keeping yourself warm and clothed is paramount to your survival. Now, to a degree, uh, I mean, again, I would expect a newbie of hiking and camping to, like, fall for a trap known as paradoxical undressing. However, with the actual knowledge that they had, they should have been able to avoid this fate. So, for your info, paradoxical undressing is in the later stages of hypothermia. Your sensory nerves at this point are not firing correctly, which can make the person experiencing hypothermia feel like they are literally on fire and, like, way too warm. It is known that six out of the nine succumbed to hypothermia, which would explain why they were feeling, like, as cold and subsequently may have been experiencing the burning sensation of warmth. But with the knowledge that you are freezing, like, they knew what was going on, that means you should group together in the tent, and that would have drastically increased the temperature of the tent and also kept them warm as well. It's just odd that they should have 100% known this. It should have been like, well, like, this shouldn't have even been a question. So why did they just run out and then just not bring anything with them? It honestly boggles the mind. And then on top of that, uh, the clothes did kind of go missing from people because it's presumed like they got taken from the already expired, which meant that they still knew they were freezing or could have a chance of freezing out there. So this calls into question, if they were in sound mind enough to take extra clothing, why would they then change out of their clothing and strip down to basically just their underwear? Unless everybody was like looking for a party, in which case, I mean, okay, but there had to have been a catalyst for all of this. A theory to kind of help explain this would arise known as the catabotic wind. In 2019, a Swedish-Russian expedition was made to the site, and after investigations, they proposed that a violent catabotic wind was a plausible explanation for the incident. Catabotic winds are somewhat rare events and can be extremely violent. They were implicated in a 1978 case at Anaris Mountain in Sweden, where eight hikers were killed and one was severely injured. The topography of these locations was noted to be very similar according to the expedition. A sudden catabotic wind would have made it impossible to remain in the tent, and the most rational course of action would have been for the hikers to cover the tent with snow and seek shelter behind the tree line. On top of the tent, there was also a torch left turned on, possibly left there intentionally so that the hikers could find their way back to the tent once the wind subsided. The expedition proposed that the group of hikers constructed two biovac shelters where one collapsed, leaving four of the hikers buried with severe injuries that were observed. A more odd one that pointed to potentially stranger events that are relatively unknown but in some ways can definitely cause impacts on people is a type of infrasound that's barely detectable to human hearing, but it continues, and as it continues, it can cause issues mentally. Actually, Earth is known to have a certain humming frequency that when astronauts go up outside of the atmosphere, they can no longer hear it, which can actually be distressing. This one was popularized by Donny Icar's 2013 book, Dead Mountain, it's the wind going around Koyat Saikal created by a Carmen Vortex Street, which can produce infrasound capable of inducing panic attacks in humans. According to Icar's theory, the infrasound generated by the wind as it passed over the top of the mountains was responsible for causing physical discomfort and mental distress in the hikers. Icar claims that because of their panic, the hikers were driven to leave the tent by whatever means necessary and fled down the slope. By the time that they were further down the hill, they would have been out of the infrasound's path and would have regained their composure, but in the darkness they would be unable to return to the shelter. The traumatic injuries suffered by three of the victims were a result of them stumbling over the edge of a ravine in the darkness and landing on the rocks at the bottom. The next one attempted to explain what may have happened based on the Soviets just sort of being Soviets. In one speculation, the campsite fell within the path of the Soviet parachute mine exercise. This theory alleges that the hikers were woken by loud explosions and then fled the tent in a shoeless panic and found themselves unable to return for supply retrieval. After one member froze to death attempting to endure the bombardment, others commandeered their clothing only to be fatally injured by subsequent parachute mine concussions. There is indeed records of parachute mines being tested by the Soviet military in the area around the time that the hikers were there. Parachute mines detonated while still in the air rather than upon striking the Earth's surface to produce signature injuries similar to those experienced by the hikers. Essentially, heavy internal damage with relatively little external damage. This is kind of like why you should lay down uh, when you face a nuke and then like push all the air out of your lungs and then hold your ears closed and clench your teeth because it'll basically rupture your lungs and intestines if you uh, do not do that. So, you know, there's something to prepare you for World War III. But anyways, 
This coincides with reported sightings of glowing orange orbs floating and falling in the sky within the general vicinity of the hikers and allegedly photographed by them, potentially military aircraft or descending parachute mines. This theory, among others, uses scavenging animals also to explain Dabina's injuries. Some speculate that the bodies were unnaturally manipulated on the basis of characteristic liver mortis markings discovered during autopsy, as well as burns to the hair and skin. Photographs of the tent allegedly show that it was erected incorrectly, something the experienced hikers were unlikely to have done. A similar theory also alleges the testing of radiological weapons and is based partly on the discovery of radioactivity in some of the clothing, as well as the description of the bodies by relatives as having orange skin and gray hair. However, radioactive dispersal would have affected all, not just some, of the hikers and equipment, and the skin and hair discoloration can be explained by natural processes of mummification after three months of exposure to cold and wind. The initial suppression by Soviet authorities of files describing the group's disappearance is sometimes mentioned as evidence of the cover-up, but the concealment of information about the domestic incidences was standard procedure in the USSR, and thus far from peculiar. By the late 1980s, all of Daitala's files had been released in some manner. With all this, others began to come up with their own theories about how it all went down, which I would have to say in some ways I agree, and then with others I sort of doubt. One such man, named Benjamin Radford, Notice how I pronounce that correctly, does suggest that an avalanche appears to be the most obvious reason. He was quoted as saying that the group woke up in a panic and then cut their way out of their tent, either because an avalanche had covered the entrance to their tent, or because they were scared that the avalanche was imminent. Better to have a potentially repairable slit in the tent than risk being buried alive under tons of snow. They were poorly clothed because they had been sleeping and then ran to the safety of the nearby woods where the trees would help slow oncoming snow. In the darkness of night, they got separated into two or three groups. One group made a fire, hence the burned hands, while others tried to return to the tent to recover their clothing since the danger had passed. But it was too cold, and they all froze to death before they could locate their tent in the darkness. At some point, some of their clothes may have been recovered or swapped from the dead, but at any rate, the group of four whose bodies were more severely damaged were caught in the avalanche and buried under four meters, which is about 13 feet of snow, more than enough to account for the compelling natural force the medical examiner described. The Venus tongue was just likely removed by scavengers and ordinary predation. On July 11, 2020, Andrew Kurdakov, deputy head of the Urals Federal District, announced an avalanche to be the official cause of death for the Daitalov group in 1959. Later, independent computer simulation and analysis by Swiss researchers also suggest avalanche as the cause. Summarizing Kurdakov's report in The New Yorker, Douglas Preston writes, the most appealing aspect of Kurokov's scenario is that the Dytlov party's actions no longer seem irrational. The snow slab, according to Green, would probably have made loud cracks and rumbles as it fell across the tent, making an avalanche seem imminent. Kurokov noted that although the skiers made an error in the placement of their tent, everything they did subsequently was textbook. They conducted an emergency evacuation to ground that would be safe from an avalanche. They took shelter in the woods, they started a fire, they dug a snow cave. Had they been less experienced, they might have just remained near their tent, dug it out, and survived. But avalanches are by far the biggest risk in the mountains in winter, and the more experience you have, the more you fear them. The skier's expertise may have doomed them. However, there was quite a bit of evidence that would completely contradict these theories, even though it was ruled as the official cause of their end. The location of the incident did not have any signs of an avalanche having taken place. An avalanche would have left certain patterns and debris distributed over a wide area. The bodies found within a month of the event were covered in a very shallow layer of snow, and had there been an avalanche of sufficient strength to sweep away the second party, these bodies would have been swept away as well. This would have caused more serious and different injuries in the process and would have damaged the tree line. Over 100 expeditions to the region have been held since the incident, and none of them have ever reported conditions that might create an avalanche. A study of the area using up-to-date terrain-related physics revealed the location was entirely unlikely for such an avalanche to have occurred. The dangerous conditions found in another nearby area which had significantly deeper slopes and cornices were observed in April and May when the snowfalls of winter were melting. During February when the incident occurred, there were no such conditions. An analysis of the terrain and the slope showed that even if there could have been a very specific avalanche that found its way into the area, its path would have gone past the tent. The tent had collapsed from the side, but not in a horizontal direction. Daitalov was also an experienced skier, and the much older Zolotaryov was studying for his master's certificate in ski instruction and mountain hiking. 
Neither of these two men would have been likely to camp anywhere in the path of a potential avalanche. Footprint patterns leading away from the tent were inconsistent with someone, let alone a group of nine people, running in a panic from either real or imagined danger. Which is odd because that one's even in inconsistent with the idea that they were running. So it's kind of a question of which do you believe? Were they walking away from the tents or were they running away from the tents? A review of the 1959 investigation evidence completed in 2015 and 2019 by experienced investigators from the Investigative Committee of the Russian Federation on the request of the families confirmed the avalanche with several important details added. First of all, the ICRF investigators, one of them experienced alpinists, confirmed that the weather that night of the tragedy was very harsh with wind speeds of hurricane force. 20 to 30 meters per second, which is about 45 to 67 miles per hour, a snowstorm and temperatures reaching at like negative 40 degrees Celsius, which is also negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. These factors were not considered by the 1959 investigators who arrived at the scene of the incident three weeks later when the wind had very much so improved and any remains of the snow slide had settled and been covered with fresh snowfall. The harsh weather at that time played a critical role in the events of that tragic night, which have been reconstructed as follows. On February 1st, the group arrives at the mountain and erects a large nine-person tent on an open slope without any natural barriers such as a forest. On the day and a few preceding days, a heavy snowfall persisted with strong winds and frost. The group traversing the slope and digging a tent site into the snow weakened the snow base. During that night, the snow field above the tent started to slide down slowly under the weight of the new snow, gradually pushing on the tent fabric starting from the entrance. The group wakes up in an evacuation in panics, with some only able to put on warm clothes. With the entrance blocked, the group escapes through a hole that they cut in the tent fabric and descends the slope to find a place perceived as safe from the avalanche, only about 1,500 meters down at the forest border. Because some of the members have only incomplete clothing, the group splits. Two of the group, only in their underwear and pajamas, were found at the Siberian pine tree near the fire pit. Their bodies were found first and confirmed to have died from hypothermia. Three hikers, including Daitilov, attempted to climb back to the tent, possibly to get sleeping bags. They had better clothes than those at the fire pit, but still quite light with inadequate footwear. Their bodies were found at various distances of 300 to 600 meters from the campfire and posed as suggesting that they had fallen exhausted while trying to climb in deep snow in extremely cold weather. The remaining four, equipped with warm clothing and footwear, were trying to find or build a better camping place in the forest further down the slope. Their bodies were found 70 meters from the fireplace under several meters of snow and with traumas indicating that they had fallen into a snow hole formed above a stream. These bodies were found only after two months. According to the ICRF investigators, the factors contributing to the tragedy were extremely bad weather and lack of experience of the group leader in such conditions, which led to the selection of a dangerous camping place. After the snow slide, another mistake of the group was to split up. Rather than building a temporary camp down in the forest, trying to survive through the night, negligence of the 1959 investigators contributed to their report, creating more questions than answers. And on top of that, basically inspiring numerous alternative and conspiracy theories like this entire channel. Keith McClowski, who has researched the incident for many years and has appeared on several TV documentaries on the subject, traveled to Dytalov Pass in 2015 with a man named Yuri of the Dytalov Foundation and group at Dytalov Pass. He did note there were wide discrepancies in the distances quoted between the two possible locations of the snow shelter where those four were found and one location that was approximately 80 to 100 meters from the pine tree where the bodies of Dortoshenko and Grinashenko were found. And the other suggested location was so close to that tree that anyone in the snow shelter could have spoken to those at the tree without raising their voice to be heard. This second location also has a rock in the stream where Dabino's body was found and is more likely the location of the two. However, the second suggested location that the two has like a topography that was closer to the photos taken at that time of the search in 1959. The location of the tent near the ridge was found to be too close to the spur of the ridge for any significant buildup of snow to cause an avalanche. Furthermore, the prevailing wind blowing over the ridge had the effect of blowing snow away from the edge of the ridge on the side where the tent was. This further reduced any buildup of snow to cause that avalanche. This aspect of the lack of snow on the top and near the top of the ridge was pointed out by Sergei Sagrin in 2010. There are also still like a lot of issues such as uh, the Mansi tribesmen being kind of blamed for this, but. They were known to be peaceful, so there was like also no track evidence of anyone approaching the tent. 
There was an idea raised that they could have been attacked or chased by some animal or wildlife, but there were also no animal tracks, and the group would not have abandoned the relative security of a tent. Another one was high winds blew one member away and the others attempted to rescue the person. A large experienced group would not have behaved like that and winds strong enough to blow away people with such force would have also blown away their tent. An argument also possibly related to be like a romantic encounter, which I think maybe, maybe has some like weight to it, but it left some of them only partially clothed, which led to a violent dispute Although about this, Eckhar states, it's highly implausible by all indications. The group was largely harmonious, and sexual tension was confined to platonic flirtation and crushes. There were no drugs present, and the only alcohol was a small flask of medicinal alcohol found intact at the scene. The group had sworn off cigarettes for the expedition. Furthermore, a fight could not have left massive injuries like the one that people suffered. There was another conspiracy theorist that apparently the U.S. had a spy plane that dropped something known as a photo flash bomb that was supposed to be up higher in the air, but because of the mountains, it blew up way too close to the ground. And when it did that, it caused all of the injuries that everybody had. And it could have also like frightened the hikers. So they left the tent and then froze. Uh, some of the hikers also could have been injured directly again by this explosion. Now, personally, I think given all the information, apart from some like government intervention and uh, what we have seen, it seems to me like the most likely combination of all of this rather than just being one event, it seems like a staple, actually, of the human condition to look towards, like, one thing being the culprit. But in reality, it may have been, like, a series of horrible consequences. Should the decision of one of the members, who was, like, more dominant than the rest, lead them to camp into a more difficult area, this may have caused a fight to break out from earlier, which, you know, could lead to kind of some hurt feelings and then threats, which could cause people to run away or walk, as they say, it caused the group to split up. It may have been possible that some others actually reacted in fear and just decided to leave the camp and this kind of created another issue which led to their exposure where they would have been found. Crime itself has been ruled out so potentially nobody was hurting anyone else but a fight breaking out anyways over like a bad call or even a girl is within the realm of possibilities and once this happened shouting could have ensued from multiple people leading to an avalanche although they still say the snow that could have accumulated wouldn't have been enough. But I also want to point out winds change. And during a snowstorm, they can definitely change. And snow could have built up. So it's not like coming back over 60 years later is really going to... Oh, like, there's no way this happened. It's like, it, it could have happened. So they could have been yelling at each other. And then this may have caused, like, a little bit of an avalanche. And then, boom, you have encroaching snow while others were, like getting almost buried in the tent, they had to escape the best way they could, so they cut out of it. Then heading to the woods, others would then meet their end after attempting to get warm by a small fire. It's just, it's difficult to 100% nail down just exactly what transpired, but I believe it's a series of events, not just one thing that can truly explain everything that happened. Either that, or it's everybody's uh, favorite neighborhood-friendly Wendigo or something, but, you know... I want to hear what you guys think because this is absolutely bizarre. The footprints and the setup of the small fire and everybody being able within talking distance and falling through the stream, all of it. It doesn't make any sense because, again, if they were stuck in an avalanche, like, how would the footprints be there? Like, why would the bodies not go further down the hill? How would the tree line not be disturbed? And on top of that, how would their tents not be ripped away and caught up in that turmoil? Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, let me know what you think again, because I'm. This has always been confusing, but uh, if you did enjoy, leaving a like would be great, and subscribing is a great way to stay up to date on what I post. So, all right, well, that's gonna do it for me. I hope everybody enjoyed this story, because good lord, it's a horrible one. But uh, I'll see y'all in the next one.